Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Weekly with Joel, Kim and Chris. On today's Davis Cup catch-up, sponsored by DownloadTennis.com. GB stunned France in an epic to qualify for Malaga. Australia also secure their place in the final eight. And we speak with Holger Rune for a Tennis Weekly exclusive. Chris, today is the 18th of September and we are here to catch up on the Davis Cup Finals group stage event in Manchester, our third and final episode at Tennis Weekly HQ. And what an event yesterday. It came down to the final tie for GB, GB versus France, the final rubber, in fact, the doubles, Dan Evans and Neil Skupski saving four match points to book the plane ticket for Team GB to Spain. Wow. <laughs> where where to begin with this? I mean, this couldn't have been more dramatic, could it? It was unbelievable. Um, they may have booked their plane ticket, Joel, but you'd booked your train ticket. I know. It was not a good move, was it? I Listeners, yes. Chris has been ribbing me ever since, but I actually had to make the last train back to London late night uh, last night. Not actually that late. So uh, I, I missed annoyingly the majority of the doubles match so uh chris you were you were flying solo right to the bitter end yeah and actually um i watched this match as um a fan i stepped away from the media section i got myself <laughs> courtside and you took the lanyard off i took the lanyard off i went undercover um i've never seen anything like that live in in sport i mean i mean you've got thirteen thousand fans there you've got all that pressure you've got match points you've got This whole narrative after winning two matches, all coming down to the last game of the last match of the week. I'm still annoyed. I'm not going to lie. I'm still annoyed we were in this position. It still, to me, did not feel right in the fact that we were 2-0 up going into this in terms of ties, undefeated. And yet somehow we still needed to go 3-0 in order to qualify. I, it, I just couldn't make sense of it because Australia, we had beaten them. They they had already qualified with, uh, you know, one, two, loss, one in terms of ties. And I just didn't understand how, like, going into this, how did we find ourselves in this situation? Well, for our listeners who aren't aware of the format, there are four teams and there are four cities. From each of the cities, two teams go through. So Australia booked their place yesterday. And because they won... 3-0, they booked at least the second spot. Um, but, I mean, that would depend on the game difference. So what it means is that we had to win in a straight shootout because one of France and one of England would have won two, lost one, and then whoever wins that tie goes through. So if France had won, we'd have the same number um, of wins and losses, but they won the crucial tie between us. So it made it probably the most dramatic it could be. Um, and I mean, pretty much every other city, they had their two finest. I mean, Italy booked their way through after one and a half matches almost, it would seem. So um, I think people from the LTA have never seen a more nervous press room. Um, <laughs> and I did reveal, I was like, oh, I booked the Airbnb. This is great. I, we're going. And they were like, too soon, Chris. Too soon. <laughs> I, know. I was waiting to post that because I was thinking if there was one reason uh we had lost it was definitely you booking the the airbnb to malaga way too wonder, soon wonder you got way too punchy to go. with the reservation yeah you were trying it. to get it in before uh yeah before it all got popular and everything sold out i might get in trouble as well because i booked it for quite a while and you know it's a knockout the next format <laughs> and we'll talk about that a bit later but i mean in terms of in terms of what we saw uh i mean it was unbelievable as a finale I mean, three match points down. It was incredible. And I think before we maybe unpack some of the actual um, earlier results, I mean, I'm still on a high from that final. And I think in press, it was just unbelievable, Mm. you know, hearing from them afterwards because I just couldn't believe that it had happened. And it felt like there was someone looking over us that was just guiding us through those match points. Um, But maybe that was just Dan Evans. I mean, what was the feeling inside the arena on those on those match points and after the match was was there some sort of nervousness because you know we were speaking about the fact that there's 13,000 people in here and it would be you know it was it would have been such a heartbreaker wouldn't it in terms of 
you know, losing on that final, you know, having been in qualifying position all all of the week to have then have it snatched from us in the final, you know, final match of the final tie, it would have been a real gut wrencher, wouldn't it? Oh, it really would have. And um, you have to put that, I guess, put that aside if you're a player. But for, for the crowd, they kept cheering. Um, Dan actually and Leon told the DJ to turn up the tunes. Um, <laughs> Leon was up trying to get people really kind of still. It sounded like Leon actually wanted to be the DJ. I actually think, you know, he would have given it a good go um, at that point. He did say in press uh, and in post-match um, uh, press conference afterwards, he said, you know, it's lonely on that bench. I need the tunes. I would have quite liked. <laughs> does he want the decks mic. like on just to the left of the bench? Yeah, I mean he does exactly. And um, <laughs> but I mean everyone. I mean it was a mixture of like thinking, you know, the classic British thing. We've seen this before in British tennis. We're like, oh, it's gonna end badly. And so I think none of us could believe that mm. we had a gold one in the we end. We used because... to kind of defeat and almost being there. Tim Edmund, all like those semi-finals be... at Wimbledon. And, I know uh... it felt like it would be too good to be true. And um, <laughs> you know, thank goodness for. You know, the MVP and for all of the fans that stayed there, Dan Evans was there kind of getting everyone up. I mean, nine hours of tennis is a lot. But um, on those match points, before we kind of get some more of the tennis, I mean, this is what he said about what was going through his mind, how he managed to save them. I think the match was such good quality. It was like every point. Obviously, we were match point down, but when they were doing the interviews at the end, I totally forgot because it was so intense. You know, I forgot we even had a match point. I think we had a match point six five, didn't we? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it's just so, such an intense and match, and the environment was was amazing. It was so loud. The atmosphere was, you know, we stick together. That's it. We stuck together. We played our plays, and, and we, you know, we <laughs> on top somehow. But that's, you know, there's something in the room where, which we were in, and it's, you know, you tried to the end and that's what we, we did he really was mr mvp wasn't he for team gp there is definitely something about um you know the, the format and and the team environment of davis cup that regardless of of what you think of it when you look at the players it fires them up and uh you know we spoke about that with leighton hewitt for, for team australia you know putting on the green and gold and for Dan Evans, I think more so than than any other player, I think in in the GB squad, it just elevates his game, and he absolutely loves it, doesn't he? You know, he loves to interact with the crowd. He loves to interact with the French bench as well. He loves to interact with Arthur Fee. It seems Ooh, um, you know, during that, that doubles, yeah. um, it was it was very very tasty at multiple points. But um, yeah, there's just something about the. Fiery. You know, being in an arena and brings out the best in him, doesn't it? And his attitude and his personality. I mean, he's determined not just to get the win for himself, but to get the win for everyone. And he'll take on the crowd. He'll take on any sort of situation. We talked they can hear it about hostile kind of away matches. And I feel like, you know, him in Colombia is the perfect example of that. Um, he He's going to give it everything. And I was right behind that for the Arthur Fee sort of moments. What, and So what was going on there? Because, you know, watching it from my train carriage with about five other people, um, it looked like he, he at, at some moments, he was like gesturing towards Fee to kind of basically just sh- shut up and, and zip it um, mm, yeah, you know, with so a hand gesture over his mouth. What was, what was going on there? I was kind of, as well as going undercover as just a spectator, I also was going undercover um, behind the French bench. Um, and they do not stop talking or jumping up and they really are standing until almost Dan was starting to serve and they really um, were quite probably quite distracting in a way that I think you know the GB bench did kind of start to get a bit more like that because it became a bit more of a thing but the referee went and sat behind him and there were some pretty stern words about um, essentially Dan Evans was saying sort of shut your mouth and um, stop kind of interfering like I'm mm. your team aren't on this side of the court so you know be quiet I think was the gist of it yeah. But we did speak to Dan. We spoke to him in press and um, someone from The Guardian asked in terms of the the handshake um, being frosted. He was like, oh, he's young. You've just lost a big match where you were winning. No bad blood. He's such a nice guy. Fast forward to the doubles. And I just thought, well, well maybe there's more here than you think. But I mean, he took on Arthur Fee twice in the doubles um, and in the singles um, and got that victory. Uh, we well, got two victories as well as the overall victory. So I mean, it was um, a fantastic result for them. And uh, a special mention, you have to say, obviously, Skupski being a, a doubles banker in this mm. situation. We're talking about the MVP. We've also got to talk about, you know, Neil and the way that he lifted his game because in that first set, they weren't playing badly, but 
I mean, a very experienced team of a 39-year-old and an over 40-year-old Nicholas Mahu, I think, were really getting it done. And um, coming in after watching, what is it, like seven hours of tennis on the bench and the nerves of that, and then having to try and get the win, I think it's just a lot to get yourself going. And he really did in those last two sets. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was I was en route to the train station and I was like, oh, well, I made the right call after you know seeing that... F- well, what following that first set on on um, on my phone? I mean, yeah, it just went away from from Dan Evans and Skupski just so so quickly. But I think what was so fun about the the doubles match was that you know we've talked about the format and the schedule all week, and you know almost this cry from everyone that we want to go back to like the old school home and away tie. And I genuinely feel with this doubles match, with the fact that we had 13,000 fans in, 99% of them were supporting Great Britain. And it was kind of a a do or die moment um, for both teams. I almost think we actually got the old format um, in this doubles match. Yeah, and they're about to get an away match um, in Malaga. And I I didn't uh, put that question to them in press at the end because I mean you've got to let them have their moment before you're like so there'll be about 10 people in Malaga um, for some for your quarterfinal but I don't think it will be like that for the finals because you know everyone is going over for that first match that they'll be playing um, and Malaga we were talking about this kind of afterwards that it kind of is our home our home tie um, I think the Brits have certainly made themselves at home in Malaga over the years I think a lot of people will feel like some November sun so um with the momentum from this sort of win, you have to feel like it's such great energy to bring to the finals. And um, especially at the end of the season, the memories of how fond Manchester was will really lift you because that was discussed. You know, it's tough. It's tough playing that last, that very last um, couple of matches, especially if you go to the final. So, um, I mean, after that first set, were you? what were you thinking when we had lost it 6-1? Were you thinking, oh, this is, this is not looking good? this is all set up for to be a horror show for, for GB or what was going through your head? And also what, what do you think was key to the the turnaround as well to go from being breadstick to going to, on to win in two tie breaks? Well, I think after the first set and watching that, um, it was quite uncharacteristic. Um, Evans and Skupski weren't necessarily gelling in the same way that they have from the off. Um, and so I think it was a case that they, they weren't playing badly, but the French pair played much better than they had done kind of this entire week. They were much more together, much more focused. Um, Serving was really, really impressive from them. Um, And I think when it comes to some of the clutch volleys and those big moments, I mean, if you play, play doubles week in, week out, I think that does help, especially in that first set. And then I think... In the second set, I mean, what was I thinking? Sorry, you asked me that as well. Um, I was thinking Joel is going to be really cross that I put the air <laughs> in me, um, as well as everyone in the stadium will be absolutely gutted. You know, face paint on, T-shirts on, the support from Andy the Murray was unbelievable. I mean, Andy Murray had a bucket hat, and obviously, like, he, he... Sir Andy Murray in a bucket hat. I mean, what more do you want? I think he's maybe, like, um, this whole week with the, you know, he's cut his hair, he's shaved, trying to kind of blend in with the Gen Zers, <laughs> sat next to Jack Draper. But um, but no, I think after that one, I thought this is going to be a tall order. Just keep holding serve is all you really can do is control your side of the net. And they did. Um, Skupski really improved his serve, which really helped. I think he was looking a little bit vulnerable in that first set. Um, and the big difference is you've got to take your chances, you know, when you're when you're down, um match points or when you're in those big moments um you have to take them and so if you're france in this there's no way they should have lost this match um given the way they started um and then given some of the opportunities they had and it impressed they were absolutely devastated and we've got to remember that you know matches are won and lost on a small number of points a break here could have won nori the match we'll talk about that in a second or um any number of things can happen so um it's just about hanging in there um, and it's about resilience and it's about believing and not thinking, you know, about the enormity of the task at hand. It's about playing the point. And I think at times the French did waver on those big points. Certainly. And uh, yeah, it was an impressive victory in the doubles from Dan Evans and Neil Skupski. I mean, the other match that we won to put us through was Dan Evans, Chris, against Arthur Fee. And this was no walk in the park either. Dan Evans coming through in three sets he defeated fee three six six three six four this was a strange match because this really was a match of two halves because fee came out he was fantastic he was muscular he was bossing dan evans from from the back of the court but all of a sudden midway through that second set it almost felt like 
for whatever reason he he imploded his level dropped and and dan evans sensed a sensed a moment and basically carried that all the way through to to match point and to and to take the victory but um it was a very odd match and and there were a lot of kind of questions also around the selection the fact that we did get dan evans and also arguably the fact that we did get arthur fee because you know we were thinking oh should that have been jack draper having played some really really good tennis this week and then for Arthur Fee, you were thinking, hang on, he's he's making his debut here. He might not be that he's not that experienced in, in handling these big occasions. Wouldn't it have been wiser to put in Adrian Manorino? Well, I love this. This is the thing that I've been strategizing about all week. <laughs> and here's my theory. I'm pretty sure that France thought that Draper would play. I don't think mm. they thought that Norrie would play based on the form and the tennis this week. Um, so I think they thought, you know, put Draper against someone younger where it's not like he will be the story of the young gun doing well. It will be two very young players. I would have loved to have seen that in the back in the back of my head. I think we're going to see that at some point on the tour. That was probably the clash I would be most looking forward to of the week. Unless mm. we got Stan Murray, of course, then that's, you know, that's the next level. But um, in terms of, yeah, so I think that's what the decision was. There was rumours of Manorino maybe being uh, a little bit injured. I think he might have been warming up that morning because it did seem like there might have been a little bit of a last minute swap sort of thing. A little bit of a um, a double bluff there from the French. Um, but in terms of the, the Umber playing, I think that was always set in stone for them. Um, and then in terms of our side... Um, I think it was a case that, you know, you've got to win. You've got to win. It doesn't matter how you win it. Do you have to win three? It's a, it's a straight shootout. You've got to win two. And so I think potentially putting Dan um, in, in that second spot, they thought probably would give him the best chance of getting a singles victory. Um, because I think if it was Manorino, Jack Draper, that would be pretty tough because he is like a wall on this court and he's very tricky yeah. for a player like Jack to hit through and play against. So, I think that was what was behind the selection. Obviously, the doubles remain the same. Um, and I think also, uh, I think you asked the question to Dan saying, do you prefer playing the first singles or the second singles? Um, and I think he said, Joel, didn't he say he liked the first one because he likes to put them out on a lead? But I thought maybe like a break so he can recover. Yeah, it was Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, he said he definitely likes, I think, the feeling of walking out onto the court first, being able to to set the tone and he was like going to battle and leading out the charge yeah, i mean he did that against fee but it was no it was no walk in the park and uh, again when fee won that first set and he was a you know he was a set and a break up i did wonder kind of is there going to be a momentum shift because it was it was at times very impressive from from someone so young the shot making breath the audience were silenced almost weren't they and i mean i've seen him play and i know how talented he is but the problem is he doesn't do it for two sets he does it for bits across three sets and and he doesn't have a double-handed backhand down the line does he well on this court it's tricky he he didn't he didn't believe in it i think is a big thing and he didn't pull the trigger enough in those later stages um i mean i popped out um because i couldn't face watching you know any more of that after that first set um and then you texted me being like what's happened has has evans lifted his game or has sort of fee kind of imploded it was one break and then he couldn't get a ball in the rest of that second set um it was i think it was i was i was really shocked i've never seen anything like that yeah yeah i've never seen uh, someone's level as I say, I think the trigger moment was like getting broken back, and I've never seen someone's level go from top so five high to outside top hundred. Yeah, it, it was, was. It, it was, was really, bizarre. it was really wild. And um, I think for for someone like Fee, it's a it's a, a tough loss to take. I think he got over it pretty quickly. Mm. Um, but Evans kept asking the questions. You know, low slices. Um, he said, "Can you hit through me? Can you keep generating the pace? Can you keep, um, can you keep this level?" Um, and he couldn't. And I think that's where the experience comes in. And that's why I think playing fee against a more experienced player was unfortunately a, a pretty bad decision. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, at, at the start, you know, in that first set, I was like, oh man, this is a this is a master straight from the French team. This is a great decision to bring fee in. But I think you saw the challenges of bringing someone in so inexperienced in, in such a big occasion. Can they handle the moment and the closer basically fee got to the finish line i sense like the more nervous you know the more nervous he became or or the yeah, more it inhibited wasn't excited, his game yeah he wasn't excited to win it he was really worried about losing it mm. um and that's the opposite of dan evans exactly he exactly. is all about trying to get the win and however he gets the win so um again i think dan evans 
is he our number one player would be my question. We're about to talk about Cam Norrie, but... Yeah. I mean, it's tricky. It is tricky. I mean, just very quickly before we get to that, I just wanted to raise you. We had a bit, a bit of a conversation on uh, Jack Draper and Arthur Fee. You think Arthur Fee level and his ceiling is higher <gasps> This isn't in the notes, Joel. Jack this Draper. is, I've been ambushed. Um, <laughs> it was a private conversation. Well, I, I was a little bit, I don't know. I'm a little bit surprised about it. I feel like at some point in the future, we'll, we will both see them in the in the top 10. And, and who knows, maybe that will be a rivalry, you know, a young gun rivalry for the future. But what, just because I feel like we've been sort of nagging on, on Fee a little bit for the last 10 minutes or so. What What is it about the, his game that you think can take him so high? I would never would kind of be negative about him. I think it's just the mentality side of things. I mean, that's what I said to you. His game is undeniable. Mm. Um, I think with with him, the serve is great. Um, he moved up the court really well um, in that first set and he kind of abandoned that in terms of he wasn't hitting the shots that set up the volleys. He's got huge firepower. Physically, he's got the body of like a 25-year-old in a way that Jack obviously has maybe um, a developing body that... It reminds me a little bit of Andy Murray at the start where you need to kind of go into it. You've got to fill out. You've got to get yourself into a situation where you can be physically um, fit. And fear, on the other hand, looks like he's he's ready to go already. So I think that is something you need for longevity at the top as well. Um, and with Jacka, I don't want to jinx it, I think, a little bit because I think he has had a lot of bad luck. He is super talented. I think his 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 level is really high. Um but in terms of like actual firepower, um, I think that Fee has more firepower, but Jack is a much better match player. Um, I think he played some really great matches where he, he's a thinker. Um, and I think Fee can overthink um, and overcomplicate things. So it's it's kind of a, a, a tricky one because I think if Fee gets his, his head together, he could easily be top five maybe. And I think Jack has a great future ahead of him. He's easily top 20, could be top 10. But I'm just my question is about the, the, the body. I don't want to jinx it. Would be more. I'm too much of a fan of Jack Draper to say he's going to win everything. <laughs> you know. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, does that make sense? Is that okay? Would he give me that? Yeah, I'm like, sure. I'm sure he will. Stand up and defend defend your words. <laughs> I mean, just looking at the the other match, we had Cam Norrie against Ugo Umber. You, you just spoke about essentially is Dan Evans. Should he be our our singles number one at the moment? Given mm. you know the the, the the, the dip in form that I think you know, Nori is, is going through at the moment. I mean, Umber came through this in another tight three-set match, 7-6, 3-6, 7-5. What did you make of this match? Because I was impressed with the ball-striking, shot-making capabilities from Umber at the back of the court. And I know we just sort of talked about Arthur Fee not really having a double-handed backhand or sort of not well, being line. a little bit kind of being a little bit timid maybe to to really let it go from the back of the court but certainly Umber was not holding back and and at times it was it was a thing of beauty he's such an elegant and, and graceful player he moves about the court very very well and uh yeah it was at times too hot to handle really for Cam Norrie he's a player and Dibonar said it when he plays some points you think he's the best player in the world and then he can he can miss and his game is hit more than you miss um and against someone like uh i mean nori he can make it difficult he can retrieve but for him to really impose himself on that match it was pretty much all on um umber's racket i mean if he if he missed four four returns in a row or if he hit three aces it was definitely a case that um he was gonna put it out all out on the court he he can't question his game because if you question it like fee did you see someone with great firepower not going for it and as soon as you get tension in the arm you miss and he did so well to stay so level-headed to win that one and um did was this the best level i've seen from nori in a while absolutely do i think he's hitting great in practice like leon smith says absolutely um but do i think when it comes to selection you've got to be winning matches to be selected i really believe that um it's a case where you might have great results at the start of the year on, on clay but do you have great results on hardcore and indoor hardcore coming into this? Yeah, it was definitely a, a tricky one, but it was arguably like from Leon Smith's point of view, he was almost like backed into a corner. You know, if I'm going to select Dan Evans, you know, in the second position, you know, coming on first, he can't go and then play, you know, a lower ranked player in this position. So it was almost kind of backed into the corner to, I think, 
you know play Cam Norrie but there are certainly questions I think in terms of you know the GB squad at the moment and you know where there are potentials to to improve and I think that's the tricky thing is the fact that in the singles there are multiple combinations and you do wonder like is Jack Draper coming on first then Dan Evans is that the stronger yeah. is that the stronger setup the, at the moment versus going with the you know the tried and tested British number one and number two in the rankings I I think that and I like Leon Smith I think he got very lucky you know match point down this could have been a very different situation from what a win incredible situation you know it's just such a an amazing um uh, result that you don't really have to kind of question decision but the, the the mood was impressed that a lot of us thought that Draper would be playing um and so I did I did get the chance to ask him you know it's my favorite thing to ask about and I think he probably realized that you can tell his tone he's like we're on selection again <laughs> um, selection <laughs> format I'm a two-trick pony um and so he he did give us a little bit of an insight into his thinking so we can listen to that now Chris Neburn Tennis Weekly Podcast. Um, Leon, there's obviously an awful lot of pressure on a captain, a lot of focus on selection. You've obviously got three wins from three matches. Um, that must be a great feeling, a great relief, and everyone's played. Yeah, but even if everyone hadn't played, it's if you, it's about winning at the end of the day. And, and before that, it just goes, people go out and give their best effort, and that's what they did. They fought so hard. I mean, it's... You can make a lot about selection, but I could put anyone out of this team. They're all really, really good. Mm. They're all really good, and it, we all understood that we would use everyone at some point. But maybe next time we win it, just mm. you got to go with what what you feel is right on the day. It's nice that everyone's played, mm. but it's not the all important thing. Um, but yeah, we we've got we've got a great group. I was trying to see if it was the whole give everyone a go. I know that he made some decisions before. <laughs> the, I know the Wednesday and the Friday match have selected the previous weekend. So this was a decision that was made based on what he saw and his gut. So I think that does lead to the question. I'm not sure what he saw from Cam Norrie this week, but maybe he saw something that we all didn't mm. see. Do, do I think that um, Norrie deserves to be part of the squad? Absolutely. He's a top player. Um, and do I think that he will be left out from maybe the quarterfinals of Malaga unless his form doesn't pick up. Yeah, I do. I think that's what Leon's basically saying, that this was the team effort. And the next one is very much, it's going to be harder to get picked. It's knockout. It's 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 knockout. You got to go, you got to go with, with your best team. And it will also factor in who your opponent is. And Davis cup draw will be taking place on Tuesday at 11 AM in London. We do know Chris, the final eight, and we do know who the opponent could be, for GB and we also know who the opponent could be for the runners up Australia so before we go to a quick break I just want to get your very quick thoughts Oof. GB have got Italy or Serbia Australia could face Canada or Czech Republic if you are Leighton Hewitt and, and Leon Smith who are you hoping for I think if you're Hewitt you're very pleased that you didn't win the group because yeah. probably the two toughest teams I would say in the competition were runners up. Um, I mean, Novak Djokovic is it's almost a bit a, annoying. Yeah, it's almost a dead cert. I mean, we're so hyped from this. And then you look at the draw, you're like, oh no, because, you know, Italy, Sinner is a great player. Massetti, they maybe don't have the doubles pairing. So I would probably I go. I mean, they still got Bele- I didn't realize Bellelli's still, still Fognini, knocking around. Uh, yeah, Bellelli has a different partner for Vognini at the moment. Yeah, because they're in different tournaments. But they, they're not a clutch doubles pair, I would say. So you'll have chances. Um, against Italy but I really think that oh I wouldn't I'd never want to know you do not want to play Serbia you know Um, you know if Novak Djokovic is playing which it sounds like he's he's going to be they are here to win it yeah this is another crowning glory it's the Novak Djokovic open for selling tickets and Mm. if you're Australia I mean I've answered for GB who would you say oh if I'm Australia I would go I'd go Canada personally. It's really tough though because I don't know I don't know what what team we're going to see in Canada because the team we got uh, you know this week that has done so well has not had their their best players in it and I don't know how selection will go for that in terms of well do you bring in you know someone like a, a Felix Ogeli Alisim into the singles. I know he's not had a great season and there is time to still pick it up but yeah I, I still I personally if I'm Australia I'm hoping for Canada. Well, 
time will tell and hopefully we'll be in Malaga and you'll allow me <laughs> to book some will flights. Tell. Will that be allowed? Well, yeah, I actually yeah, I think now it's safe to say yeah, we you the Airbnb Good. It was a good move. Wasn't it was a good, a good move. move now. I can say that, yes. And I had the, yeah, the belief. We can... I had unwavering belief. <laughs> and, um, and I think that that's what that's what we should say for, for this half is that n- no doubt is here. No, never no doubt any is. moment, not we, three much we, points down. We can, uh, we can look at the flights and we just... All we need now is we need we need the GB bucket hat. I think we need the GB bucket. Hat. We need a tennis weekly bucket hat as I well. Kind of, uh, I want to get in the band. I think that might be the best oh, way. Oh, get, in get the band. into the band. Yes. Yeah, I think okay. that could be it. And then, um, yeah, I'll play triangle because I'm I'm just musically incapable. Well, I mean, wonderful. I mean, you can clap pretty well. I'm sure you can do that. <laughs> yes, and I'll do some clapping. That's, that's something we'll we'll delegate that to you. But very excitingly, we're stepping back in time in the second half, aren't we, Joel? Yes, it is very, very exciting for Team GB getting through to Malaga. But yeah, we're going to be stepping back in time uh, in, the, in the next half, which we recorded yesterday. Looking back on Australia qualifying also for Malaga, as well as the United States being upset by Finland. So do not go anywhere. Welcome back to the Tennis Weekly Podcast, sponsored by DownloadTennis.com. And now we're going to move on to Australia qualifying for Malaga, the United States being upset by Finland, and we also have a Holger Rune exclusive. So a jam-packed second half to come. And Chris, we're going to start with Australia defeating Switzerland 3-zip. Kokinakis and Dumanor getting it done in the singles and Ebden and Purcell in the doubles over Stricker and Hussler. Australia are on their way to Malaga and I feel like this week, of all the teams, arguably, they have been going through all the emotions. I mean, this was a very different conversation that we had earlier in the week mm. when, you know, they'd lost their first match, they lost the first rubber of their second tie. It was now or never. That's my new favourite expression, is it? Now or never. I mean, I think Alex de Menor quite liked that when you <laughs> called it, said that to him because then mm. it, it was now, it very yeah. much was now. And um, since then, they haven't looked back from from that tie. They haven't lost another end. No. So Alex de Menor won, the doubles won. They won five in a row um, in terms of matches. So... I mean, such an interesting perspective of how you start versus how you finish this. They're the first through to Malaga. It's it's very impressive. And it's, it's funny how the scheduling has almost ended up like this because we actually thought, you know, I thought actually, you know, during the start of the week that the scheduling was going to count against Australia. You know, they had GB and France back to back, very, very short turnaround, arguably with the two toughest nations. But yeah, they managed to get it done. I mean, what impressed you in this tie? As I say, it was 3-0. They needed to win 3-0. What impressed you most? Who impressed you most? Yeah, they need to win 3-0 to guarantee that they could be the masters of their own destiny and go through this evening. So, that was very impressive that they they went out there with an attitude of getting it done. You know, it's it's not like they had to sit around tomorrow and wait for someone to win or lose. Um, so I think that whole mental perspective really mm. impressed me because that could go one of two ways. And we've seen so much mental resilience from uh, especially Diminar, where the pressure is on you to be number one. So I found that very impressive the way after that first loss, I thought maybe, you know, talking about a lot of time on court, maybe he'd run out of steam. Um, he definitely hadn't because he's only got better as this tournament's gone on and as this week's gone on. And that's been very impressive. But for me, I'd say standout performers for the entire week, but especially today, I mean, it has to be uh, the doubles pair, Purcell and Ebden. I mean, they are a cut above when it comes to doubles here. They and are very tasty. Yeah. They I mean, are very, very tasty, aren't they? It's a guaranteed point in each tie. Mm. It has felt like that this week, and with De Menor as uh, playing that sec- that second match as well. It, like, yes, he had that little blip against Dan Evans, but it's a very strong, like number one player to have. I feel like the only argument they really have is over who plays that opening tie in the number two singles position. And it was interesting today because Leighton Hewitt, he you know he gave his backing to to Kokinakis. Kokinakis lost that epic match against Jack Draper probably should have got it done didn't but he didn't let that sort of 
factor and, and cloud his judgment. He was like, right, Kokonakis, I'm backing you to go out there and get the singles victory. And he proved him right. Yeah, and, and Impress, he did say that, but Kokonakis was actually directly in his eyesight because the whole of Australia had snuck in to the press conference. <laughs> so It was quite funny, wasn't it? It was, uh, yeah, we had, what, Diminor in the back row talking to Ebden about his double-handed backhand. We and... had, yeah, about the backhand return. We had Ebden, have you ever been, <laughs> has a lob ever gone over your mm. head? Arguably better questions than probably what we put to yeah, them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you can be the judge of that when, <laughs> when we share some of that later on. But no, I think um, Kokonakis was... I mean, saying you have 100% faith based on what happened previously, I think mm. is a slightly strange thing to say. I think you can really believe in the player you put on the court, but um, Kokonakis doesn't necessarily believe that he was going to serve it out today or that he will serve it out, but it he was, did. It was very tough, wasn't it? I mean, it felt like there were moments where he had to overcome real adversity, particularly in that second set. You know, there were a lot of break point back opportunities, I think, for Dominic Stricker. And if he was able to take it to a third set, it really would have felt like a, a momentum shift and maybe you know, Switzerland would have got you know that first tie on the board. But you know I think it was very impressive though by Kokinakis because he's not, I think, the most natural front runner. We saw that you know with the Jack Draper match and actually the more and more this match went on against Dominic Stricker, it was sort of going down the same path in the same narrative that I think that Jack Draper match was going down. Yeah, I mean, you look at it on paper, it's literally a left-hander under the age of 22 who's <laughs> had a very good US Open, yeah. you know? I think it's a situation that someone like um, Kokinakis, who's a bit further along in his career, who hasn't had those results and hasn't closed out matches, I mean, it's almost a mirror image, and the match looked like it would be a mirror image. There were chances, um, Stricker did break back, and then Kokinakis broke back, and then he did serve it out, but mm. he was slowing things down a lot after those first two match points went awry, and... I did think, and we were saying, oh, we can see this one going to three. We still weren't sure. And until that last point was won, um, the it serve, wasn't done. It wasn't yeah. done. The it serve got him through, but... Particularly because, uh, you know, he obviously served for it uh, you know, against Jack Draper. And I wonder if that had gone, like, through his mind. But, um, yeah, I was almost sort of relieved for him that he was able to get it done because, uh, you know, he had been playing the better tennis in that match, but Stricker was certainly knocking on the door. Yeah, and when it comes to, you know, selection, and we talked about this, um, you obviously said De Manai is a fantastic number one. Mm. Um, he's not always going to get the point at number one, um, mm. but they will almost always get the doubles point. So you've got to get one of the two. It's a three three tie situation. <laughs> um, I mean, it's funny you say that about Dumanor because in in press, Leighton Hewitt talked about the fact that he never takes for granted Dumanor in that singles position. And uh, again, I thought it was mightily impressive from him this week in the fact that he's been in some moments where. It has been now or never. You know, the whole of, of Team Australia and their chances of getting to Malaga have rested with him. And he's been able to kind of take that in his stride and pull out these performances. Yes, you know, he obviously was defeated by Dan Evans, but since then, he's never really looked back. No, no, he hasn't. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's no no shame in losing to a Dan Evans who's mm. playing that well. I mean, he obviously won in Washington and pushed Carlos yeah. Alcaraz. I mean, he wasn't really that down well actually he was a little bit downhearted but I don't think that was necessarily needed because yeah as you said Dan Evans had pulled out a very very good performance it's tough because you know you're 2-0 down you've lost the first two uh, two ends two rubbers of your first tie it's a different situation to be in. It's not the dream start you want. And the pressure was on him to deliver. And he, he didn't at that time. Um, winning the middle set also in matches, that definitely is something that, I mean, the pressure then is for you to then keep that momentum going. So he must have thought, I've turned this around. And then he wasn't able to, to do that at the end. But um, again, it does. I mean, that question, who would you bring to Malaga, Joel? Mm. Would you bring Popper in? He's just sitting about here, you know? He's doing a couple of interviews. He's, a bit so, of waste, he's so wasted, I think, as a, as a hitting partner. And it does feel like the only question I think that Team Australia have is with regards to, you know, the, the opening match with that, that singles second position. Because it could be... It could be a few people. I mean, they've used Max Purcell this week. They've used Kokinakis. Jordan Thompson also has been on the bench. And he's clapping away. Yeah, he's just been clapping away uh, with his fantastic moustache. But, uh, yeah, it's almost surprising, I think, given the season that Popperin has had, that um, you know he's been underutilised. I mean, he's obviously been kept within like the team just not in a official playing capacity but I do think there's going to be a question there providing you know everyone is fit you know what what team does um you know Leighton Hewitt take to to Malaga because there's certainly more options than just 
the squad he had in Manchester. It's all about Rinky for me, you know. <laughs> Jason Kubler? Jason Kubler. I mean, I think that in the on-court interview afterwards, Naomi Brody said the only country that has more people in the top 100 than Australia is the USA. Mm. So, I mean, lots of choice for Leighton Hewitt. And I think it's sometimes having a lot of depth um, is great, but it also means that you are maybe lacking that superstar performer um, for that second spot. Um, and we've seen it with, uh, you know, Felix and um, Shapovalov when they've been on top form, that you need two fantastic singles yeah. players inside the top 20. That's the dream. It's I mean, the that's dream. the dream situation. Otherwise, we end up rotating and rotating and we're not <laughs> sure and we're still not sure um, who would be the top pair for almost all the nations who mm. played so far. Yeah, and, and as you said, Purcell and Ebden, they, they play great. I mean, they're just such a formidable team. They probably played the, the highest level of doubles uh, in you know, in Manchester this week. They probably got pushed the hardest by Skupski and Evans. But the fact that you've got Purcell, who's versatile in the sense that he can play singles and doubles, and you've got Ebden, who... Is, is just a very tricky customer on, on well, the season, court. so season fresh from a US Open final, yeah. a real uh, comeback season for them. And yeah, I mean Hewitt, he is someone who is very sure of the decisions he makes, mm. um, and I think he doesn't necessarily question them. I mean that doubles team is pretty much the only. Uh, uh, well, and De Menor actually, it's, it's they're, they're both locks. I feel for you know Malaga in terms. He's of... He's got one like, decision. I guess time. one decision to make yeah. actually. But um, I didn't question him about selection this time because that is a surefire way to get yourself into <laughs> yeah, trouble. Yeah, he didn't like him. that. Yeah, he didn't, didn't like, like that it. Last no, no, no. Time. I mean, it was quite late, so you know we'll give it. We'll give and they it were time. playing the next day, having yeah, lost. Yeah, yeah. So benefit of the doubt, Leighton. But in terms of what we did talk about, it's our favourite thing, which is all about the format, format, format. format. Format, 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 love it. Yes, so we did say well done, but we said, what about Malaga without Spain? And kind of, what do you think uh, this will happen? Will it bring about an end to the format? And this is what he had to say about it. Long finish here in Manchester, looking forward to the finals in Malaga. Um, obviously, uh, Spain aren't going to be there, and we've had Andy and Stan talking about the format. I think we spoke about the title format the other, the other day. Um, do you think this will be a real test for the format without having a host nation there in the finals? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, I've said it for years now, but the, the two greatest things that Davis Cup had was best of five sets mm -hmm. because it's the pinnacle of our sport. The Grand Slams are the pinnacle. It's what the players play for all year, four majors. And to get the opportunity to have the Davis Cup and now competition uh, online and, and in the same uh, format, playing five set tennis, um, we were fortunate to have that. And that's something I never took for granted as a player or a captain. Um, and then the other thing is home and away. There's something special about playing home and away because some of my greatest memories are obviously playing in front of packed Australian crowds where they're all, all going for you. Um, but as a team bonding and working together, playing in places like Brazil, Spain, France with 15, 20,000 people barricading against you, um, you find out you know, how tough you really are. And uh, it's a very, you know, it's a great thing to represent your country in those situations. And playing in front of 500 or 1,000 people, it's not the same. But as I've told these boys all the time, the pride comes in wearing the green and gold. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, no matter what, what the format is, we're still going to go out there and leave it all on the line. But do I agree this format's good? No, mm -hmm. not for a minute. A couple of things there. I mean, he did say no matter what happens, whether you're playing in front of 500 people um, or you're playing in front of 20,000, where the pride comes from is wearing the green and gold. So that is the party line, I guess, in that sense. And that's how he motivates his team. But it sounds like, you know, he wants to bring back five sets. And also, you know, he wants 20,000 people against him in Brazil, which I think is quite a Leighton Hewitt response, as opposed <laughs> to not everyone would fancy that. I love how you've said, you know, it's about wearing the green and gold. I don't know if Matthew Ebden got the message, because is it for him the lime green and gold? It was because... almost like he's wearing two different highlights. It was colours. odd. It annoyed yeah. me, actually. It wasn't that co colour coordinated. Yeah, it was, especially in a doubles court, you've got to match. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it was interesting, I think, for, you know, Leighton Hewitt, because the, my take on it was that he, you know, he said, you know, he's said impressed that you know, he's played Davis Cup. He was, a, you know, he's been a player for Australia. A hundred years. For, you know, for 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, he was like, almost like, back in my day, Davis Cup was great. The home and away format was great. Best of five, etc. And um, he really, really did not like, you know, how, how it's evolved. And, you know, for him to get back to those, you know, former glories and, 
maybe for the Davis Cup to have the respect it should deserve and have the profile with the fans it should deserve mm. it needs to arguably for his point of view it feels like he wants to go back to the old format and it's not just kind of him regaling tales and, and nostalgia. I think he genuinely believes, like, we need to go back to this in order for not just the Davis Cup to survive, but really to thrive as well. Yeah, and for players to want to play it. I think that came out from what Murray said, what Stan said about the times of year, how often to make yourself available. And mm. we have got more clips of Leighton actually will be on our social channels where he does unpack this in a bit more detail and he is very firm in what he believes. And um, the key thing coming out of this week when it comes to the format is that everyone we've spoken to has universally said that the format is broken and it's either revert back to what they had or find something that is better. Um, and so far... Uh, it seems like there isn't a one solution for this right, right now, but what we have is not good enough. Mm. Exactly. And uh, before we get on to looking at some of the other results, Chris, I know you love being a strategist for Davis Cup teams. You, you keep telling me this week, it's like, I think they should play so and so. He's got a better head to head record against that opponent, yep. et cetera, et cetera. We've spoken about Malaga, we've spoken about Popper in. What team would you take if you were if you were Leighton Hewitt and everyone was fit? Would you be taking the same team? Would you be trying to make a space for for Popper in? And if you were, who would who would unfortunately be the the full person for you? I mean, Popper in has to be there in my mind. Um, he's got a great serve. I don't imagine that himself or Kokonakis has played particularly much on the indoor courts of Europe. Um, mm. So I think. Both of them do a, a similar thing. The only advantage of Kokonakis, in my mind, is the double side of things, that he has had great success. He's won a doubles Grand Slam. Yeah. And if you have an injured player, you can't suddenly rope in an extra person. You have to go with what you have. So I understand that as a flex option. So maybe it would be a case of um, Jordan Thompson wouldn't get the call because mm. um, obviously he wasn't used or put in the mix despite his ranking. And that maybe the case would be getting two players that can do both in Max Purcell and Kokonakis, but Popper in, in my mind, would be my number two. Yeah, it's, it feels, it, feel, it just felt a little bit odd. It was it really strange. I don't know what, we don't know what the, the situation and around picking and selection was with regards to that but the fact that he's I had a brilliant dare ask season after yeah that I know. first question after that first I was like question. my follow up no <laughs> but yeah he's had a brilliant season and I'm almost thinking he needs that he should have that recognition of being he's in deserved it he's done so well Australia. to come back and get mm. to this point and you know late and let him wear the green and he's gold. also been on the tennis weekly podcast oh, when he was at the boot friend of the well. pod now surely so exactly yeah. exactly but um yeah i mean australia will be i mean they re they reached the semi finals last year and they will be hoping to well, go they reached the finals last year oh, australia sorry, yes they? they did indeed lost yeah. to canada um i believe that must be the case yeah. because that is what i've been told okay right sorry my my mistake right they they're looking to go one further this time and they will be relieved i mean they would have known that spain are not going to be there and also who are not going to be there are United States. United States lost today in a shootout tie with Finland. I can't believe it. The mighty Finland. Finland. The mighty Finland. The famous tennis nation. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they lost both singles matches. Otto Vatanen defeated Mackenzie McDonald, saved two match points, won it in a final set tie break, 9-7. And then we had Emil Rusevori defeat Tommy Paul in straight sets, 7-6, seven, 6-4. Six, six, so Finland got an insurmountable 2-0 lead and are through to Malaga. United States won't be there. I mean, this we talked the other day about that Canada result being one of the biggest shocks in, in Davis Cup. I don't think this is that far from it. If anything, I think it's probably a bigger upset. I mean, Finland, when you see them on the list of the countries that were competing here, they were almost the one of the weakest, really, when you look mm. at it, um, if all teams are at full strength. And not all teams have been at full strength this week. And uh, this is a case where... Leighton said it in, in press as well that there's no easy Davis Cup match no. um, anyone can win everyone's inspired and when you play for your country anything can happen um, that pressure can get to you like Kokonaki serving for a match it can also inspire you to play some of your best tennis and you know playing against like the USA maybe there is this added pressure on them because there is so much um, uh, national pride that exists yeah. there and there is so much pressure for them when they have all these great players um, that they can play and maybe that's too much for them to always deliver on I mean we'll talk about United United States and their team in a set but let's talk about Finland because Finnish tennis I feel is booming at the moment and as soon as this result happened I was almost like their captain needs to be on the phone to the ATP and WTA event organisers because there's no events at the moment in there's none I can no. confirm yeah Helsinki 500 
A 500, I would it? go. There needs to be, I think, some sort of consolidated Scandi swing. You know, we, we talk about the golden swing in South America. Yes. We talk about the, you know, North American hardcore swing. We talk about the Asian swing coming up with yes. Shanghai. We need the Scandi swing, and I think we need, like, the... One extra tournament. We need so... the cherry on the top. We need a 500 event, I think. And I'm I'm saying Helsinki. Right, so I know you're not a fan of Boston. You know, you don't <laughs> like that clay period, the European clay. Are we going to mm. get rid of that one, are you suggesting? Because I'm not sure that would be the most popular. Just get, here, just get Finland in somewhere. Just somewhere. add in Finland. I mean, we, we, there's, there's been so much more, I think, flexibility with kind of single-year licences. We've seen that, the good and the bad. And I yeah. feel like this is a really good opportunity because Finnish tennis is booming. But there's not a tournament in Denmark, though, so... And there's, I mean, well, yeah. yeah. So we're adding two. I think That's we should add, tricky. We're adding two, maybe. The Scandi swing, it just should just get bigger and bigger, right? Um, Very but, convenient um, for Tennis Weekly Podcast. <laughs> but I mean, this was such a great, this was such a great result for them. Um, but at the same time, yeah, for the United States, I mean, what is going on here? Because, you know, during our, our round by round pods during the US Open, we talked about the depth of US men's singles tennis at the moment. You know, so many players in the top 50, in the top 100. We're talking about Ben Shelton, Francis TFO, Taylor Fritz, uh, Christopher Eubanks, Michael Moe, all these all these players, and yet they're not going to be in the knockout stages of the Davis Cup. I mean, this feels like a a massively massive own goal. Why why do you think that is? Is is there a sense of complacency within the team that they could just field out any old any old team and, and get the job done? I mean, it does feel like that at times. We've, we've often seen, I mean, at the Billie Jean King Cup, we've seen Danielle Collins be maybe the number four player for um, mm. the USA, but she's been leading the team. We've seen that before. L- not all players make themselves available for it. And we don't know what the story is here with Taylor Fritz. We don't know who was up for it, who wasn't. I mean, it's not like he spent much time on court in the US Open. No. Um, whereas I think, obviously, TFO has played a lot of tennis recently. I think when it comes down to it, I mean, going from the US Open being the big tickets there that they are, I mean, they were filling stadiums to, you know... Split in Croatia. Exactly, on a a no home is this, I mean, a, is this a neutral like a, tie they wouldn't they don't like to go and you know they can do it at the US Open in Flushing Meadows but can they do it on a cold hard court in front of 50 people in Croatia they're not they're not maybe going to get up get up for it I think there must be something in there that it must be a very strange switch for them um, and I, I think I can understand that and it, it almost seems like the disappointment of, of losing or not getting the result that you want at your home slam can also lead to this being mm. a more of a letdown because you know, for someone like TFO, there's going to be some frustrations with how he, he played in that semi final. There were chances, um, especially in that tie break in, in that uh, quarterfinal against uh, Ben Shelton, I, I believe. And um, it's hard to pick yourself up from that and play for your country the next week. Potentially, that's all I can say. I'm not saying that that's an excuse, but I mean, if you're from the USTA, being knocked out by Finland yeah, should be a great. humiliating effort. It, it, you know, I, I think there almost needs to a be a wake up call. It, surely. it is a wake up call. And I think it does need to be some sort of reset. And you said earlier, Leighton Hewitt said he, he's been captain, he's been a player, he's been involved in Davis Cup for so long. And he said there are no easy ties. And I do think that there needs to be that approach from the USTA and, and that so needs get to filter down. Team. You need to get the best team, regardless of it's if it's like the group stage. Um you can't just assume you're gonna make it to the you know the quarterfinals and the knockout. And uh, you've got teams like Finland who, as I say, they're hungry. It's Davis Cup format, anything can happen. And uh, I think United States they almost need to be more aware, you know, of it. And it, like granted, yes, there were matches that were very close and they could have gone either way. But ultimately, they just didn't get the job done. And uh, I think they'll be ruining like a very big missed opportunity for them, given the fact that, you know, they would have known that like what Spain, another big hitter, has been out earlier in the week. You know, this this will be like, oh, yeah, we could have added another, we could have added another, um, you know, title to our, our trophy cabinet. I mean, would it be a title or would it just be qualifying? I feel like um, every match you've got to treat completely differently from what you've had before. Yeah, and I think Mackenzie McDonald almost got it done. TFO obviously would be the mm. natural choice to play. There are question marks about a lot of things when it comes to this. But um, again, I think let's not take it away from Finland because fantastic effort throughout the entire week. And we've seen all these amazing upsets, which is great from the story perspective. But if you're a Malaga tournament organiser, you must be very, very um, concerned. They must be quaking in their boots at the moment. At least the weather's nice. It's hard to fathom almost kind of what this is going to look like because at the moment they've got 
Got Novak Djokovic and not a lot else, really. I think it's the Novak Djokovic Open. Yeah, yeah. I think that will be. I think he's going to lap it up. He, I almost think like he's the more and more big names not going to be there. He's I mean, going to Serbia lap it win up the Davis Cup. More. He's already a god there. I yeah. mean, this would be something else. But I mean, Murray said sell it based on um, if it was a two fifty and who would be the player that you would use to attract it. Well, let's say it's a two fifty mm. and Novak Djokovic is playing. Yeah. I think we're going to sell some tickets yeah. still. That will be the on days. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's it's going to be fascinating to see. I mean, elsewhere there have also been some other. Uh, oh, well, can I say can I say this is an upset? Denmark, Denmark lost to Brazil at home three uh, one. Uh, Denmark winning the dead rubber there. But um, Chris, you weren't you weren't there. Obviously, we're here in Manchester. But Tennis Weekly were there and we did able to get a Holger Rune exclusive yes indeed um, I I am based in Copenhagen normally but we were still able to be present despite the fact I was in Manchester um, we had our roving reporter Alina Sopana who was there as well as assistant production help with Christopher Tinsetta so they were there capturing everything that went on from Love there um, so Joel is this the first time that we've been at two events at the Ten- same time Tennis Weekly has gone can we say worldwide I mean you're in New York City uh, for US Open I, I've just been in my room in, yes. in London um, I've been to Manchester I've been to Manchester on the train and any, in Denmark as well we're at any ITF event that will have us <laughs> but um, but no so they were very much present there and um, unfortunately obviously Holger didn't get the win for Denmark there and uh, he did have an injury issue with his thigh he was receiving some treatment there so um, we actually managed to ask Holger um, kind of given, you know, all of some of the injury issues and niggles that he's had. Um, and then the next day, I think we always see on social media, he's back on the court. Mm. I'll come back harder than ever. And it seems very, very abrupt. And that maybe if he was doing it again, would he play as many tournaments and would he play less next year? And um, how does it feel working with his new, well, his childhood coach, um, Lars Christensen again? So uh, we'll hear from him now. Um, you've had quite an intense year so far, and you're well locked in top 10. Uh, you've had some niggles and played through them. Looking back, would you have taken more time off to recover? And will this strengthen for a season be less? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, when you're young, you're always very eager to play almost every week. Um, but, but definitely there's a few tournaments, you know, if I could say that this year I could put a few out that I, that I played and, you know, some I, I did very well in, but maybe it was not the right thing to be able to peak at the best tournament. So, you know, it's, it's all a learning process and, and, and also I have to, you know, kind of look at the big picture to, you know, get into my best shape in the biggest tournaments because uh, that's where I can, you know, move up the rankings now and gain the points that I that is necessary um, but yeah I mean now it's just for me to get flow in the matches again feeling healthy and uh, hopefully being back to playing at uh, my level and you recently announced a renewed partnership with your uh, ex-coach Lars Christensen um, and you have two weeks uh, at home um, in your country, how is this? It's been good two weeks. I've uh, been practicing well. Um, it's nice to be, you know, back home in Denmark and be back to to the things that I'm used to to do and used to train and the way of training also. So um, I was really positive. Obviously, didn't know what to expect. You know, you come back to the to the coach that that you wasn't with in in America, but very very positive. And uh, as you know, we do Beijing together, so I'm gonna see him soon. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm already. Even though I lost yesterday, I'm feeling better in my shots and uh, I feel like my technique and then my movements, my security in the shot is already improving. I mean, it's great to hear it was a good question. Uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, you've got the whole seal of, seal of mm. approval there for Tennis Weekly. But uh, in terms of his response, it is very refreshing that, you know, he's looking back and thinking, I'm young, I'm excited, I'm learning this. I want to play tournaments. I want to be on the tour. Um, and you can see that. I mean... What we know about Holger, he loves tennis, right, Joel? Mm. He's, he's an addict. This is a question. Almost, he loves it too much because it's almost like blinding his. I think, like, I'm on schedule. one. Uh, yeah, I'm on one I'm like, leg. Let's yeah, play the yeah. BMW There's, Open. He just wants to play every single tournament every week of the year, and I get that. I love that passion. You know, that's one of the reasons I started the. You know, the, this podcast. But I think maybe this season, maybe there'll be a period of reflection at some point to think, kind of like, actually. Maybe there were times where I shouldn't, I shouldn't have played. Yeah, and and he said and, and that. And start actually playing more. I think like a, you know, he's a world number, world number four ranked yes. player, and you don't associate world 
number four ranked player with a, a week in, week out schedule. Yeah, and having a and big I think he result. Needs to, he yeah. needs to get over that, doesn't And he? when they have a big result, you don't have to play the next week. Mm. And I think um, he's gone back to back and he said even tournaments he's done well at, he would have thought about. So um, I think we're going to see that number four schedule, mm. we hope, so that he can peak at those main, uh, major events because he hasn't had a bad year by any means by slams, but he wasn't able to peak in Australia and he wasn't able to peak in the US Open. So um, what's also good is that he's feeling very positive about kind of returning to his um, childhood coach of Lars Christensen, which is great. Back in the safe hands, he's been training uh, back in Denmark for the last couple of weeks, and he's feeling really positive about some of the changes in his game, which is great to hear. He has said that he's back on the court, which I'm a bit concerned about because he was injured yesterday, but um, we'll move past that. As he say, he's learning. He's learning, he's growing. <laughs> he's but learning. I'm going to do it again. My most match on the podcast, yeah. I'm going to say it, I'm going to bring it up, Emma Raducanu, may Maybe he should take a leaf out of another young, successful player's book. Mm. And I'm just saying, Andrew Richardson, he's still available. Give him a call. Go back to your first coach. Well, well, let's see how Holger goes. But... um, (laughs) That, that, if there's an opportunity it, that question is just never going to go away I'm going to call up my childhood coach <laughs> yeah not sure where they are now but well, yeah well it's been a very fascinating week on the Davis Cup circuit particularly in Manchester but also further afield and listeners I hope you've enjoyed our coverage we just want to say thank you to everyone who's listened to our live specials we really enjoy as I said doing the travel putting the hard yards in to come up and hear you know hear from players hear from press hear from coaches and we hope you really really appreciate um, hear from fans great hear to meet from people fans as well. well I know exactly we uh, we did speak to some fans in the stadium and uh, yeah it's nice to it's nice to actually speak to people about the podcast in person and uh, yeah I had my little hat on so it was almost I'm in my head I was like this this was my like beacon this was a signal I am tennis weekly podcast come come to me and we can have a chat about Demi Shaw's reaching Guadalajara main draw. Indeed, I mean that's um, <laughs> that's something for for another day and another podcast, maybe. Mm. But um, absolutely, it was fantastic to see see everyone there, and I think it was a case where there were an awful lot of people who were very committed, especially today, who came out. There yeah. was much better crowd today, so um, great to see yeah. the people there. Big big kudos and we are gonna leave it there tennis weekly will be back next monday and we will be back in tour catch-up mode to catch up on all the action from the guadalajara 1000 event on the wta tour chris has actually been looking at some of the results already from qualifying it's set up chris very very quickly it's set up to be just like the most open 1000 draw i feel like in in recent memory given all the seedings that have dropped out I mean, it's going to be wild. Ostapenko is the number six seed. It's Kennan's for the taking. It's it, Honestly, it is Kennan's for the taking. But I mean, they say that draws are made to be broken, but this draw is starting it's already broken. broken. It's already, it's already broken. broken. Right, yes. Well, we're going to see how that develops over the week, but we're going to leave it there. Listeners, I hope you have enjoyed our Davis Cup coverage with the Tennis Weekly podcast. Remember to subscribe to us to stay up to date on all the action still to come from the ATP and WTA tours. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and all major podcasting platforms out there. And if you like what you're hearing, then make sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also follow us on social media. You can see all of the pictures that we've taken and the videos and the content to come from the Davis Cup. Um, And you can also email the show, but we're on social media on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, X, formerly known as Twitter, at the handle at Tennis Weekly Pod. You can always purchase that cap that Joel was talking about, the Tennis Weekly merch, the beacon at tennis tournaments. (laughs) Great cap. Yes. Even for indoor events. Indoor events, yeah. It was the sun was blindingly yeah, blinding, warm. Blindingly warm. It was actually the draft that was just keeping it up his face. But um you can purchase that at etsy.com slash shop slash tennis weekly podcast. You can email the show tennisweeklypod at gmail.com or check out our website tennisweekly.co.uk. And we will be back next Monday at Tennis Weekly HQ to catch up on all the action from Guadalajara in Mexico on the WTA Tour. So I hope you can join us for that. But in the meantime, it's goodbye from Chris. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. We'll see you again soon.